Here's a little React Server component secret for you. Did you know that you can pass promises as props to your client components? It's awesome. It makes taking that data that you get from asynchronous services and sending it to your client components so much easier. I'm going to show you how to do that. I'm going to show you how to handle errors, do streaming, and integrate it with one of your favorite query managers coming right up. But in the meantime, I want to tell you about ProNextJS.dev. I'm working on a full app router Next.js course, and you can sign up for notifications about it at pronextjs.dev, and you'll get articles and tips and tricks about Next.js for free. It's going to be a fantastic resource. Please sign up today. In the meantime, of course, let's see about this power combination of RSCs and U's right now. Let's get right into it. Let's start off by building a stock app router application. We'll call it RSC use, and we'll use all the defaults. And I'll bring it up in VS Code. And here we are in VS Code with our application. Of course, the finished version of this is available to you for free, of course, on GitHub in the link in the description right down below. I'm going to start by taking most of the contents out of the main route. So I'm going to replace all of the stock boilerplate in page.tsx with a much simplified boilerplate. And I'll put in there, hello world, and we'll start it up. Looks good. So now in order to test API access, we kind of need an API. So let's go build a very simple API route. So I'm going to create a new folder called API. And then within that, a new folder called foods. And then within that foods directory, I'm going to create a new route handler. This gives us direct access to get, post, whatever you want. So I'm going to override get. And I'm going to create a list of foods. And then I'm going to bring in next response. And with that, I'll just send the foods back as the result of the API. Now, I do want to be able to tweak how fast this responds. So I'm going to go and put in a wait. In this case, I'll just start out with a wait of 1,000 milliseconds or one second. OK, it looks pretty good. Let's give it a try. So I'll go to C slash API foods route. And now a second later, we get our foods. So the next thing to do is go back to our home route and then make that request to go get that data. Now, this is a React server component. Any component is going to be, by default, a React server component unless you put on use client. In a React server component, I can use an asynchronous request by just making this an async function. Next, we're going to make that request to the API that we just created. We're going to actually add on that cache header where we say we don't want to do any caching because Next.js does a lot of aggressive caching on these endpoints. Now, food request is a request object. That's got a bunch of functions on it, like .text, .blob, .json. We're going to use the .json function to get our data. And we'll use a wait on that because the return from JSON is in itself a promise. Now, the whole point of this is to show you how to transit data to a client component. So we got to go and create a client component. So I'm going to create a new directory called underscore components. I put the underscore on there because that tells the app router to just avoid that directory for routing purposes. And then within that, I'm going to create a food list component, which is pretty simple. It's a client component. It takes a string of foods, and it then joins them together. So let's go try this out. So to try it out, I need to import it. So I've got my food list. And then I can just invoke it with the foods array, which is now just an array of strings. What's it save? And there we go. Now we have the server making the request and then sending the data to that client component for rendering both on the server and on the client as a property. Now, I think for a lot of folks, myself included, they thought that this is where the whole story around properties to client components ended. But it doesn't end there. But let's go take a look a little bit more about this so you can get a sense of what's actually happening. So I'm going to duplicate this a bunch of times. Hit save. And now we've got a bunch of food lists up there. But let's go take a look at the source. So this is the rendered HTML of the page. And what you can see at the top is the HTML. And that would go out to search engines. And so this is a fully server-side rendered page. Even though the food list is marked as a client component, it is server-side rendered. But if you look at the bottom of the page, you can see the virtual DOM. And in the virtual DOM, you can see that we have a bunch of copies of our food list. So if you had a big payload, 
not the five foods we have here, but something much bigger, you're not going to want to go and send that payload over and over and over again as properties because it's going to bloat out this page and the whole page payload itself with multiple copies of that payload. So let's keep an eye on that as we go forward. So now let's get into passing promises as props because it's going to solve one of our issues right away. And that issue is that we are awaiting that API request every time we render this home component, which is not great. It ends up blocking the rendering of this application. So any components that are nested within this are going to block on that initial fetch. So can we avoid doing that? Well, sure, let's get rid of the async and let's get rid of the await. And for the moment, let's just not even worry about the .json. And now we're going to pass this food rec as a promise. And we'll call this property food promise instead. Now let's go over to our food list. Turn that into food promise. So let's go back to page and see what's going on. So we get a right squiggly on food promise. If we bring up the helper on that. We can see that we are getting a promise response, but we're actually trying to send it as an array of strings. So what we want to do is pass a promise to an array of strings. So let's go and change that to a promise. And now in here, we can use the use hook to essentially crack that promise. And we can get the foods array from the food promise simply by just using that use hook. All right, let's try it out. And we get foods.join is not a function. So why is that? Well, let's go back into our food list and we'll console log out what foods is. Now, thanks to console ninja, we can see that foods is an empty object, which is kind of weird. Well, what's actually happening here is that when we think about fetch, again, we don't get back the JSON payload directly from fetch. We get back an object. And that object has a bunch of methods on it, like .json, .text, .blob, and those are functions. And one of the things that you can't marshal across the server to client boundary is a function. So it sees an object full of functions, removes all the functions, and what you get is an empty object, which is not what we want. What we want is the JSON. So the way that we're going to do that is put a then on the end of the fetch. And that then will be given that response object and then return the promise from .json. That's going to give us our data. Let's save. And there we go. Boom, just like that. Now let's repeat this a bunch and see if we have that same data duplication problem that we had before. So now we've got a bunch of components. Let's take a look at the source. And now, yes, we are still getting our SSR behavior, so everything's looking good there, but we are still getting a bunch of duplicated copies of the data in that VDOM payload. So how can we avoid that? One way to do that is to use a React context to pass the promise down to the food list. To do that, we'll create a new food provider client component. So we'll create our client module by using use client, then we'll bring in create context. And we'll use create context to create a React context where we'll hold our list of strings or null. Now, in this case, I could just put in an empty array, but I figure you're probably going to have more complex payloads. So showing you how to do this null pattern makes more sense. Next thing we do is create a custom hook called use food promise that uses use context to go and get the data from that food context. And if it's currently null, it throws an error. That just means you haven't wrapped your application in that provider. And speaking of providers, we will create a food provider that we will then export as the default, and we'll use that in our application. Okay, let's go take that back into page. Now down in here anywhere, really, we can create food provider and then give it our food promise. And then we'll close that up. Awesome, now we can get rid of it in our food list. And then go over to our food list and use that new hook that we created to go and get that data. We don't need the property. And instead of the property, we use use food promise. Hit save. And now everything works. And let's go take a look at the source. And now we're still SSRing, but we can see that we only have one copy of the data. Yes!
So of course, when you're working with microservices, not everything goes right every time. Sometimes you get an error, and sometimes you get a slow response. We'll talk about both of those by starting with how to handle errors. So we can simulate an error by just chaining on an additional then, and then throwing an error. In this case, we say bad response. Let's go see that on the UI. OK, so we get the bad response, but obviously it's not handled in a graceful way. So what do we need to do? We need to use an error boundary. So let's go bring in an error boundary library. We'll bring in the cleverly named React Error Boundary Library. And then back in our page, we'll bring in error boundary, and we can just wrap our app in that. Now, error boundary requires a fallback to tell it what to actually say when we have an error. So let's add one. Something went wrong. Let's hit save. And now we get something went wrong, and we get a handy error in development mode that actually tells us what the error was. So we're not missing the error, but we are able to control what the actual UI shows when we get an error. So nice. And of course, in this case, I put it at the top so we can handle all of the errors anywhere in the application. But of course, you can put it as many times as you want, wherever you want, so you can kind of granularize that error handling. Now let's talk about a slow response. So let's get rid of our error. And then we'll slow down our route. We'll make it a five second response. Now we'll give it a try and hold and hold and hold. And now after five seconds, we get a response. So that's not great. We want to be able to tell the user what's going on. So what we can use is just a suspense. So we bring in suspense from React, and then we wrap our food list in that suspense. And let's just get rid of these other food lists. And we'll put in a fallback with loading. Now, of course, you can put whatever UI you want in there. You can put skeletons, you can put spinners, whatever you want. Let's hit save. And now we hit refresh, and we get the loading. And then after five seconds, we get the response. Boom, just like that. So that's basically the fundamentals of promise handling when it comes to the basics of React and the app router. Of course, if you want to know more about all things AppRouter, again, be sure to sign up on pronextjs.dev. Now, I want to get even deeper into this. And to get there, I want to show you what we're actually getting in terms of these promises. Like, what do we actually get? What is that prop? And then from there, we can start to see if we can do some interesting stuff with it. So let's go back over to our food list. And we'll get that promise. And we'll console log it out and then pass it to that use. Let's hit save. And now we can see with Control Ninja that we're getting called three times. And every time, we're getting called with a promise. Food promise is an honest to god promise, both on the server and on the client. And what can you do with promises? Well, you can use things like SWR or React Query to handle promises, right? So let's try that out. Let's see if instead of using use, I can use something like Tanstack's React Query. So first off, let's install React Query. Now, in order to use React Query, you need a React Query provider. So let's go and create a React Query provider. That's a client component that creates a new query client and then just wraps whatever you give it as children in that query client provider. Let's go bring that into our page. And then wrap our page in it. Now let's go take our food list and make from it a React Query food list. So we're not going to use use. Don't need that console. But what we do need is use query. And then down in food list, we'll replace use with use query. So you've got to give use query a query key, in this case foods, and then a function to call to do the query. In this case, we're just going to give it a function that returns that promise. So when it comes to the value of foods, which are just remapped from data, it could be null. So let's just use the optional chaining to avoid the error there. And then finally, let's put RQ there just so we know that is React Query based. We'll go back into page. And now we can bring in RQ food list. And then we can use it anywhere we have both the query provider and that food provider. Let's give it a go. Awesome. And they both work off of exactly the same promise. So you can use use or React Query in combination with each other, or exclusively, whichever way you want it. But the keen-eyed observer in you will notice that we didn't wrap the RQ food list in a suspense like we did the food list. And yet, it's still rendered. 
So that's actually one of the advantages when it comes to React Query. You actually get, in this case, some additional values like is fetching, and you can use that to manage the suspense UI by looking to see if it's fetching. If it is, then you just put up whatever UI you want. Now we get our RQ loading, and we get our data. All right, I hope this gets you excited about the promise of using promises in your properties with React Server Components and the App Router. If you have any questions or comments, be sure to put that in the comments section right down below. If you want to hear about more stuff in Next.js at the enterprise level, be sure to jump on to pronextjs dot dev and get signed up on that mailing list. It is free. In the meantime, of course, click that like button if you like the video. Click on the subscribe button if you really like the video. And of course, click on the bell if you want to be notified the next time a new blue collar coder comes out.